Hi. So how is everyone doing today? Good, good. Um, all right, so my name is Slavio. Thanks, thank you for, uh, for the nice introduction. I I'm sure thank you said lots of good things about me. Um, and, and apologize in advance for not speaking, you know, giving this talk in your native language. Uh, it would, it would take me a few years to learn Chinese. Uh, I, I promise I will start though. Uh, eventually will come and deliver a talk in your native language. But for the time being, bear with me, all right? Uh, one thing that I'm not sure if thank you said is um, at the end, he will handle questions in, in Chinese. You know, I don't want to shy you away, so if you uh, are able to follow the presentation, then hold your questions, say it in Chinese, thank you, help with the, with the translation, all right? So today, I'll be talking about uh, Pravega. So you learned about Pravega at least a little bit at the keynote earlier today. And I'll be covering Pravega in more detail. And uh, as part of explaining Pravega to you, I'll focus on, on one particular problem, which is the one of ingesting and processing data in, a, in an exactly once manner. I will use Flink as, as an example of a stream processor with which we can, we can achieve that. And we show other mechanisms in Pravega that allow you to uh, obtain this kind of properties. But Pravega is, of course, um, the, the, the rock star of the presentation. So before I tell you uh, about the problem, about the properties, and, and how we solve it, I have to tell you about Pravega itself, what Pravega is. And I want, I want you to leave this presentation with a few concepts in mind. All right, so even if, you, uh, if I lose you in the middle of the presentation and, and you don't get the whole thing, I want you to keep at least a few of these concepts. So Pravega is about storing streams. So it's a storage system, it's not a pub subsystem. The foundation of Pravega is segments. Segments are append-only data structures to which we append bytes. We will see why that is important, but the bottom line is that uh, it's, it, it enables a flexible composition of strings, uh, enables things like scaling, transactions, uh, and even state replication. Provega is open source. You can, you can check our website and uh, our, our GitHub. We are not an Apache project, or at least not yet. Uh, but you can, you can, you know, it's, it's still under the Apache uh, 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 V2 license, and uh, and you're free to contribute as well. So we are interested in having a community-driven project. So feel free to check, and uh, the project can interact with us. So it, now, in the talk itself, for the rest of the talk, there will be four parts. I will talk about data streams because I need to motivate them a little bit so that you understand why I use segments and how I use segments. And then I will talk about Pravega, its features, its architecture, how we store data, how we control the streams in, a, in, a, in the core of Pravega. Then I'll talk the problem of uh, ingesting data in an exactly once manner. And then I will show some code and, uh, and, and a demo. All right, so data streams. So when I talk about data streams, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a classes of applications where the sources are continuously generating data. We can have end users, like in a social network, we can have uh, users in an online shopping kind of application, or browsing for products, uh, purchasing products. All, those, uh, all that is information that can be produced, and you might be interested in processing it for recommendations, for insights, uh, for actions even. But there's a whole new class which makes the problem even more challenging, which is the machine-generated uh, machine generated data, the sources that are actually machines. And there you can think about the, the classic example of a, of a fleet of servers doing telemetry over, the, uh, over those servers. Um, and in newer classes, like IoT, edge computing, where we have connected cars, we have drones, uh, sensors of, of all sorts, continuously generating data. Uh, the estimates of the amount of data that we'll be generating out of those sources alone, uh, it, it tells us that uh, it's gonna be very, very large, and this is gonna be a very challenging problem going forward, and hopefully Provega will be uh, a system that will help us to deal with, uh, with those problems. Now, if I focus on a data stream itself, the, uh, our intuition says that it looks like something like this. Right, a sequence 
of, uh, of, of events. And that's a very nice representation. It matches what we learned in school. But in reality, it, it's more complicated than that because I don't have a single source. I, I have multiple sources in parallel producing data. So a, a stream in real life, in production, looks more like this. A bunch of parallel flows of, uh, of, uh, of data. But it doesn't stop there. A real stream it looks even more like this, where I, th the, flow, the, flow, um, the flow that I get is not constant. Right? So it fluctuates. I can have lows, and I can have highs, and that can vary according to days, or weeks, or, or all sort of patterns. So keeping that in mind, that's, that's the reason why we endeavored into designing a new system to store such streams. First, we felt that uh, traditional abstractions of uh, storage systems, file, objects, they do not really capture what, um, what these new classes of applications are bringing to us. And so we propose a new storage, uh, storage system where a stream is the primitive. So we store a stream and we serve a stream. And one of the big benefits of doing that is that not only I can process, I can tail a stream, process the, the, the recent data of that stream, but I can also analyze historical data. So I don't have to move my data around anymore. I can uh, process the data out of the same source always. So I ingest the data once and I can process it either when it's produced, when I'm taking the stream, or, or any, arbi any arbitrary point later uh, in the future when that data is needed. So tailing and historical processing are both possible with, uh, with a storage system. Now, if I project that to, uh, to how we believe this is going to, to be used, uh, we have been talking about data pipelines. So I discussed the source, the sources, potential sources, the data flows. Um, and now, the way we process it is using data pipelines. Data pipelines have, they can have multiple components, but they have at least two very core components, which are uh, a, a storage and a stream processor. And those can be combined in a number of stages of, uh, of storage and, uh, and, and processing, uh, up to the, the, to the point that you have results that, uh, that, uh, that your application, your application required. And we believe that the combination of Provega and Apache Flink uh, makes very powerful um, stream pipelines. All right, so let's, let's talk a bit more about Provega now. Remember that I mentioned segments. So let's define segments. So segments, uh, a segment is a storage unit for us. So that's the unit that we store in our underlying data plane. And it's purely an append-only sequence, sequence of bytes. Now, pay close attention to bytes here because it's not events, it's not messages or records. Uh, we, on purpose, make it flexible at that level we do not store, we, we do not, yeah, Provega internally does not understand events, records, or, or any abstraction like that. That's an abstraction of, uh, of the application or even of the API. So for events, for example, we have an event API uh, that requires a serializer from the application to transform the, the events or messages or whatever abstraction the application has into bytes. One of the things we can do with the segments is to provide parallelism. I can have a number of, of parallel segments. The application or the sources can, um, can append to those segments in parallel. We use routing keys to map, uh, uh, um, to, to map events from the event API or appends to the, to the stream segments. But it's not only parallelism, or, or at least it's not static parallelism. We can also have dynamic parallelism. So in this figure here, what I'm showing is I am starting with a, um, I'm starting with two segments, and at some point it becomes five segments, right? Which means that I have scaled up. I'm giving more capacity to that stream, and later it becomes three segments, which means that I have scaled down. I do not need those resources anymore, so I I, uh, I bring down the amount of resources that I'm using. And so Provega gives you that ability of scaling streams like that. And it's also done 
in, a, in an automatic manner. So we have the ability of, uh, of auto-scaling streams. You can configure a stream so that, uh, so that Protega tracks the behavior of the stream, and, uh, and if it gets loaded, we, we react it. We react accordingly. Or it gets less load, then we also react by scaling down. But it doesn't stop there. We can also provide transactions in a very efficient manner. So when we, we begin a transaction, we create transaction segments. When the application appends to the transaction, it's appending to the transaction segments. If the application decides to merge, then those transaction segments are merged, uh, sorry, the application decides to commit, then, uh, uh, then Provega merges the transaction segments into the primary segments of, uh, of, the, of the stream. But if the application decides to abort the transaction, then we just discard the segments, it's like the data was never there. So that makes it very efficient um, for us to implement, uh, to implement transactions. And it also allows us to specialize segments in ways that uh, we can do uh, other nice features. We can do state replication. We have the notion of uh, revision streams, uh, which essentially means that uh, we append conditionally to, uh, to, to, to the stream. And by doing those condition appends, we can implement uh, uh, an abstraction that uh, is as powerful as a replicated state machine. We expose an API called the state synchronizer that allows you to do this kind of, of replication. Um, not only exposing the API, but we use that internally. And this is one of the things that I, I, I'm going to use later on in, a, in, a, in an example. So let's look at a, at a, a bit of the architecture. So how does Pervega look like? On the client side, we have, we have writers. I'm going to focus on, a, on, the, on the event API. We have, um, we have other APIs, like a, a, a byte stream API. Uh, we have a batch API. We have different kinds of APIs that leverage the flexibility that I, I mentioned for Pervega. But here, I'm going to focus on the event one because it's a, it, it's a commonly used one. So the, the, um, on the client side, we have event writers that are the ones appending. Right? So this is no different from what I discussed a few slides ago, the append to, uh, to the segments in the stream. And on the reader side, we have event readers. They, they are part of a group. And the group can, can grow and shrink. We can add or remove um, readers as the application needs it. And they coordinate to, is to, to split the load of the segments in the stream or streams that they are reading from. Internally, we have uh, two main components. One is the controller. The controller is responsible for maintaining the stream metadata and also the lifecycle of transactions. And we have the segment store. So the segment store, as the name says, it stores segments. Segment store relies on tiered storage. It has a tier one that we require to be um, fast for small writes. And for that, we use Apache Bookkeeper. And we have a second tier to which we, we tier to automatically, uh, which is based, it could be a number of options, and, uh, and it's based on either file or, or object. So we can have an object store, we can have a file system that we, have, we plug there, and, uh, and, uh, and it will accommodate the data long term. So that's where we store the data of streams long term. Also in the segment store, we have the notion of segment containers. We do, we, when we balance load across segment containers, sorry, across segment stores, we don't do that on a per segment basis. We do that on a segment, uh, on a segment container basis. So if, for example, if a segment store instance crashes and we reassign something to the remaining segments, uh, segment stores, that will be segment containers and not segments individually. All right, so this is a Flink conference, so I need to talk about Flink. Uh, I assume that uh, most of you know a little bit about Flink, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about Flink itself, but I want to talk about the connector. So we, we have implemented a connector. Uh, so we have a, a, a sync connector that implements a source function that is used to get data out of a Flink job into a Provega stream. And we have a source connector um, Actually, I think it didn't say it right. So that brings a sync function. The source connector implements a source function that uh, reads data from Pravega and feeds it into the, 
in Chuasun job. And you can see the repository here holds the, the, the different connectors. This is where the, the code lives. The idea is that, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the idea is that we build stream pipelines where Provega is the storage component. We use it initially for ingestion, then we have stages of, uh, of, uh, of flink processing and, uh, and Provega storage. And that can go in an arbitrary number of ways. So it really depends on the logic that the application wants to implement. So re reading from, from Provega, let's see how, how we read from Provega. So re reading from Provega is interesting because remember that I mentioned auto scale. So the set of segments of the stream is changing dynamically. So how, how does the, the, the source connector deals with that? It doesn't. We do that transparently. Right, so that assignment of, uh, of segments uh, to, to readers is done completely transparent, uh, is done transparently from, uh, from the application. And so in the case we have multiple source tasks, each one will be running a Provega reader instance and they will jointly coordinate to, to get that assignment done. Now one important aspect that, uh, that we have to implement is um, you know, how to deal with the Flink checkpoint. So how, how do we do it? So initially, the master initiates a checkpoint by invoking a call on the reader group API. So it says initiate checkpoint. Now that is going to trigger the processing of the checkpoint across the reader group. They will coordinate using um, a state synchronizer. I mentioned the state synchronizer earlier, so they will use a revision stream to uh, to do the coordination. Each reader individually will, will emit a checkpoint event. That checkpoint event is going to trigger the the emission of the um, of the barriers of the checkpoint algorithm that uh, that Flink runs. And finally, when that's all done, the master receives a checkpoint that is stores as part of the of the Flink. It receives a Provega checkpoint, which it stores as part of the of the Flink checkpoint that is uh, that is generated. This is just to illustrate how you can use a, Pro a Provega reader with your application. So this defines a, uh, a source. Uh, it's an instance of the Flink Provega reader. And if you want to use it, you add it as a source to your, uh, to your environment, just like you would do with any other source. Writing to Provega. So when writing to Provega, the interesting case is the one in which we provide exactly one semantics. So for that, we use transactions. So the same tasks, they write transactionally to, to Provega. And the whole flow looks like a, a, a two-phase commit. So th this is how it flows. The Flink master, it starts that process like we have seen for the source. It starts a checkpoint. And at some point, the source task emits the, the barriers. When the same tasks receive all barriers uh, for the edges that touch them, then they acknowledge to the Flink master. The Flink master, once re it receives the acknowledgement from all things, then it completes the checkpoint, notifies the, the, the things, and at that point, they commit their corresponding transactions. And by doing that, we, uh, we enable exactly once end-to-end -end, uh, with both Provega and, uh, and Flink. To create a Provega sync, or similar to what we have done for, uh, for, for, um, for the source, we use a, Prove a Flink Provega writer, and we, we add a sync uh, with add sync function. <coughs> All right, let, let's do a bit of a recap. All right, so before I move on to the, to the, next, um, to the next part of the talk. So we have talked about um, data streams, they are uh, unbounded sets, uh, data that is being continuously generated by human beings, right, and users in social networks or online shopping, all, all sorts of applications. They can be machine generated to connected cars, sensors, drones, uh, all sorts of, of, of machine sources that you can think of. Then I use that to motivate um, the kinds of streams that, are, that are we believe are out there, right, where we need parallelism or we need to adapt to changes to the incoming workload. So the traffic can change, so you can have more traffic at some point, and then later on you might, ha you might have less traffic, and you need to be able to adapt to those changes. I showed that Provega provide features to, to deal with that. 
Right, so I showed that uh, by using segments, we can have parallelism and we can have dynamic changes to that set of, uh, of, uh, of segments. Then I showed the architecture of Provega that used tiered storage and, and the connector that, uh, that we have just discussed. Now, one interesting problem is, um, if you think about what I said a few, uh, well, one or two slides ago, um, we, I said we are able to, to obtain exactly once end to end with Provega and Flink. But I didn't say anything about how the data got to Provega. Right, so, so did, did the data get duplicates when coming to Provega did, or, or maybe we lost some, some data while getting that to Provega? And so the, the rest of the presentation will be devoted to, to that problem. I will show you one solution, it's not unique, but I'll show you one solution leveraging features of, uh, of, of Provega to obtain exactly that. So let me talk about exactly one suggestion. So the problem is, is the following. I have a data source and I have some application that receives uh, events from the source. And there is some logic. The logic could be as simple as just relaying the events or there could be some pre-processing. It, it doesn't matter for the purposes of, uh, of, of, the, pres of the presentation. And then we have uh, an event writer. It's a Provega event writer. It's, again, receiving the events and, uh, and, and appending it to a Provega stream. So that's the setup we'll be working with. Now, we have to think about the data source types. Um, and why is that important? Well, because my data source type could be memoryless. I can think of a sensor that, uh, that doesn't buffer any data at all, right? So it, it measures something like temperature or pressure, or whatever it is, and emits the sample and forgets about it, right? So I, I can think of sources like that. But it can also have memoryful um, sources, which are sources that can rewind to arbitrary offsets of, uh, of, uh, of the data. And the classic example for this is files. Right, so you can always go back to uh, any point of a, of a set of files that, are, that, are, that you're reading. Of course, it doesn't have to be unbounded, right? It could, it could, you can think of sources that have bounded uh, buffer, in which case you just have a limited capability of, uh, of rewinding in the case you need to retransmit. But let's see how that impacts the, the mechanisms we, we, we can provide and how we can write applications. So memoryless sources. Um, we have, I'm assuming, a memoryless sensor here. It emits samples and forgets about them. So it emits like three samples. They, then the application receives it and writes um, blue and red. And then what happens? Connection drops. So what does the application know about it? Have the events been written? Have they, you know, have they not been written? Um, the application at this point doesn't know what happened. Uh, unless it reads from, fr from the, the stream. But the reality is that uh, we, we do something for you here. So under the hood, the writer has a writer ID, and in the segment store, we keep the writer ID and the event number in, in, a, in an attribute of the segment that, uh, that, that has been written last. And so if it happens that the application wrote one event, and when it was writing the second event, the connection dropped, so we never received the ACK. Mm -hmm. Then what will happen is when we when it creates a new connection, it will have a handshake with the segment store. It will say, um, you know, my ID is 10. Let me know what was the last written event. And from that, the writer can resume from the correct um, from the correct event, uh, from the correct append. So that's, that's one way to, uh, to get around this problem when we, when we lose connections and we have to, um, to resume connections. So back to the example, uh, now the application will simply submit black because it knows that, uh, that blue and red have been successfully written. But now what happens in the case that uh, before writing the black events, the application crashed? Right, if the application crashed, then when it comes back, it has no way to get the, the, that event back. Because remember, so the application crashed, so the memory state is gone, right? And the sensor cannot retransmit it. It's a memory, memory less source. So in that case, uh, we can do anything about it. 
but we can do for memory full sources. So let's see what, what we can do for memory full sources. So for memory full sources, um, I'm assuming that uh, such a source is capable of rewinding. Right? So there's some notion of offset, and that I'm able to tell it, you know, roll back or rewind to this particular position and resume um, events or data from there. And one simple example of such a source is one, is one more files, a directory of files. And an offset in this case would be a pair, like a file name and an offset inside, the, inside that particular file. And I can have more complex examples of such a source, like a, a flink job itself. Right, so that would be such an example. So for, for the sake of example, let's focus for the rest of the presentation on files as a, as a data source. Okay, so we are back to the situation in which we, we, we are reading, okay, so we are reading from a file. Now, the source is a file. It's not a, it's not a, um, a stateless source as before. So the application reads from, it reads two events and is reading a third. And at that point, it crashes. Now, with, with this situation, if I'm writing like this, then I'm, I'm in the same, the very same problem that I had before with the, the memoryless sources, right? So the application doesn't know where, where it stopped. So to overcome that, we introduce transactions, right? So we write in a transactional manner. So we, before, before writing anything, we create, the, the application creates a transaction, writes the events, and if it succeeds in writing all events, then it commits the transaction. Now, it creates a new transaction, take the remaining events, write those in the, in the transaction, commit the transaction, so I'm done. I've written the whole file. All right, nice. But what happens if the application crashes in the middle of a transaction? Right, so in the, in the past run, I assumed that both transactions succeeded just fine. But it could be that it crashes in the middle of a transaction. So what happens then? So it, for example, in this case, in, during the second transaction, the application crashed. So when the application comes back, um, how does it know up to which offset has been, uh, has been successfully committed, right? So even if I'm using transactions, I, I still don't know what has been written or has not been written. So for that, um, one possibility is that we use the state synchronizer to do it. Remember that I mentioned that state synchronizer is a way of coordinating states uh, with one or more processes. And so we're gonna use this to, uh, to, to solve this problem. Now, the state synchronizer, um, now in a bit more detail, is an abstraction available in the client API. It enables the coordination of, uh, of one or more processes. Um, the process updates the state of the synchronizer conditionally. Now, the state is something that, uh, that the application defines. It's not something that we define, the application defines state. And, uh, and it reads the state to, to, um, to keep track of changes to apply changes to its current state. So it doesn't matter if it applies updates or not, it's always consistent, but, uh, but you always want to refresh so that you have the latest state. Um, the application now running example will have a shared state, which is, um, which is a pair, a starting file offset transaction ID, all right? So again, let's start over. We create a transaction, um, we write to the state synchronizer uh, an offset and a transaction ID. Now, we write the events, we commit the transaction. We create a new transaction, write to the state synchronizer the new, the new pair, offset, transaction ID. Append the, append the events to the transaction, commit the transaction. So this is essentially how the flow works. Um, now say the application crashes before committing the transaction. So if it happens, then it will recover in the following way. It will pull the shared state from the state synchronizer, so read that status. We check if the transaction with that ID has been committed, so via an API call, check status. Um, if not, it aborts it. Otherwise, it, it resumes um, from offset three. Right, so now the application knows where to, uh, where to resume from. All right, so, so now what I want to do is um, talk a bit about, about the code to implement this, to implement this example, and show a quick demo of it. 
So the code is, is, is super simple. Um, it iterates over a set of sample files and, and it does one transaction per file so that it doesn't have to bother about offsets within files. Uh, so in, in particular, there is no restriction with, uh, with respect to the amount of data you can have per transaction. So a way of simplifying it is just to put a whole file into a, into a transaction. And then it commits once all events of, a, of the file have been written. So the, is the sample implements a state synchronizer. Uh, upon creating a new transaction, we update the synchronized state as, we ha as I have described. Um, state is a single value, is an instance of a type uh, called status. Uh, the status data structure is a file ID and a transaction ID. And the last part of, uh, of, the, of the sample talks about recovery. So in the case you restart the process, it fetches the latest status abort outstanding an outstanding transaction if there is such a transaction, and set the start file, so the file to resume from. So before anything, we need to create um, a couple of streams. We create a stream for the state synchronizer, and we create a data stream. So that stream for the, for the data itself that we want to ingest into. Then, um, then, well, actually, since I'm here, let me, let me talk a bit about this. So here, I, I can define a scaling policy for the stream. I have, the, by, by saying fix, I have disabled the auto-scaling feature of, a, of the transaction, because in this case, it's not really needed. But I can set a value, which is the, the, the number of segments that, are, that you have for that, uh, for, that, uh, for that stream. So in the case of the synchronizer, I really use only one segment, so I set it to one. Um, for the other stream, I'm setting it to 10. I just for the sake of doing it, right? Could have been something different. Uh, then we iterate over the files. So we go over, we go over the set of files, um, and, and if the file has already been processed, then we skip it. If not, then we begin a transaction for that file, set the, the state of the synchronizer, uh, update the status in the synchronizer, then goes into a loop. Um, not representing the loop here, but it, it's, it's essentially a loop that is going on here, right? Writing events to, to Provega. And once that is done, once that step is done, we, we commit the transaction. So that's, that's roughly what the, what the code does, right? So this is an, an skeleton, obviously, um, and, you have more, uh, and you have more detail in the repository itself. The state synchronized implementation must implement a few classes. So the, first, the, the, the state, you have to define the state. So the state needs to implement this interface called revision. And I'm calling it datable status. Right? So that's what I'm calling it. Then I need to define uh, an initial state for the synchronizer and what an update looks like. So that's essentially what, a, what, a, what is the delta between uh, what I'm updating and the, current, and the current state. So finally, I have a state synchronizer um, uh, um, variable here that keeps the, the synchronizer itself, and I have a bunch of access methods that uh, just make it easier for the application to, to use it. So that's the idea of the implementation of, uh, of that class. For the recovery, remember that uh, what the first thing we need to do is to get the status from the synchronizer, so we get it, and get the transaction ID, check the status of the transaction, so if it's open, we abort it, and resume from the current file. If it's already aborted, or aborting, so the, the, what's going to happen to the transaction is already decided. There's nothing the application needs to do at this point. So it simply sets the, 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 the start file to be the current file. But now if the, application, if the transaction has been committed already, then, um, then we set to the next file rather than the, the current file. All right, so let's see, well, let's see if my demo is going to work. So let, let me give it a try. Here's what I'm gonna do. First, I will, not here, uh, this is my sheet, cheat sheet. <laughs> um, first, I will start Provega standalone. So we have a standalone version that you can run in your laptop, in your desktop machine for development task purposes, right? So I will start with that. So let you run. Um, let's check the other things, okay. So, um, 
one thing I want you to do is let's check. I cannot go faster with one hand, sorry. <laughs> All right, so, so these are the files I'm going to read from. There are, um, th there are 50 files. There are, if I remember correctly, yes, I, I think there are 1,000 files that I have generated for each file. 1,000, so total I have 50,000 50, events, all right, that I'm gonna read from. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm, gonna, I'm going to run the application. So that's the application that, uh, that reads the events from the file and write to Provega. All right, so it's, it's writing. Um, what I want it, so you see that for each file, it begins a transaction and commits a transaction. So what I want you to do is, I will, I will control C in the middle, all right? I'll control C in the middle, which means that uh, it has stopped, well, probably stopped in the middle of a transaction because we didn't see the committing transaction message, but we can know for sure. So what we expect to happen is, if I run it again, it should resume from that, uh, from that file 15. So let's run it again. Um, let's see what it does. All right, so it started from the right file. So let's, let's let it run through completion. Um, it's gonna take a while. And then what I'm going to do next is, I'm going to use a no-op flink job to read those, um, those events so that we can see by the UI, whether it has the stream really has um, fifty thousand events. Not this one. This one was me testing it. All right, so there is a running job. Let's look at that. All right, so you, you can see. I don't know if it's too small, uh, <coughs> but trust me, it says fifty thousand here <laughs> and fifty thousand here as well. So, so it, it, as expected, it's read. Um, each event uh, at least once and at most once, right? So in the end, it's, uh, it's exactly once in just an, as we want it. All right, so back, back to the slides. Back to the slides. Um, I wanna say a few words about concurrency before I, before I wrap up. Because remember that I, I said, um, you know, the state synchronizer is good to replicate state across processes. But then you're thinking, hey, Flavio, you just, you just talked about one process. Where is the concurrency in there? Uh, it is true. I just talked about one process to illustrate. But the technique is still correct. It's still correct because I, I, I can't I can argue correctness in the following way. We do not allow duplicates. Because when a writer, uh, when a writer does it jo its job, it must update the state of the synchronizer conditionally before writing and committing. So if there, is, if there is a race, then only one is going to win the race. Um, it's complete because writers follow a, a sorted order of files, right? It's just by the, 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 the nature of the program, right? That uh, it doesn't skip any existing files. So we guarantee that we, we, write, uh, we write every file. Now, the one part that, uh, that the state synchronizer does not do automatically for you is liveness. Right, so I don't know, say that, that for any reason, um, uh, two processes conflict, and they both think that, uh, that there is someone else doing the job, and so they both exit, and, and then you make no progress at all. So that is possible, but that's outside the scope of the synchronizer itself, although you can still do the synchronizer by implementing um, leader election, right? So leader election is, uh, is, uh, can be implemented in a number of ways. You can do it yourself, obviously, but you can do with Zookeeper, or I don't know, any other uh, consensus, um, consensus system out there. But the idea is that uh, is that, uh, uh, that will enable liveness for you. 
although it, will, it won't avoid by itself zombie riders altogether, for which you need to use the previous technique that I just presented. All right, so I'm ready to wrap up. To conclude, I have talked about Pravega. Very important, Pravega is stream, is storage for streams, where streams is the storage primitive, not an object, not a file, which is what we used to see in storage systems. So here it's a stream. And the, the great advantage that we provide by, uh, by, by giving the ability of storing stream data in that form is to be able to process streams both with, with low latency when you're tailing a stream or at any point in the future, any point later, if you want to do historical processing over that data. So Provega is built on, on the notion of segments. Uh, the idea of segments or the, the, the segment units is what makes it very flexible, right? The core of Pravega, not only for streams themselves, but the features that we offer, remember, state replication, transactions, all that. We, but Pravega by itself does not process data. Pravega stores data, right? So to make sense uh, out of data, you need the stream processor. And I have argued that, uh, that uh, Pravega works well with Flink. We can obtain exactly one end to end uh, using Flink, especially now if you use the techniques I, I have just described. Uh, I have talked about uh, the, the connector itself and, and, um, and then argued that uh, we still need to worry about the exactly one ingestion part, for which I have focused on using um, features of Pravega to solve that problem, using transactions and using the, the state synchronizer. And so if anything, if anything, um, you gotta remember four things about Pravega. Stream storage, it's about tail and historical uh, processing of stream data, uh, stream parallelism and scaling, and consistency. <laughs>